right. I'm here today with Ken W. Good, a noted bail attorney and a board member of the Professional Bondsman of Texas. He graduated from Hardin Simmons University in 1982 with a Bachelor of Arts degree. He received a Master of Education degree in 1986 from Tarleton State University, a part of the Texas A&M system. In 1989, he received his law degree from Texas Tech School of Law, where he was a member of the Texas Tech Law Review. Uh, Mr. Good has argued cases before the Supreme Court of Texas and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, along with numerous courts of appeals, including the United States Courts of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Uh, Kim has, or Ken, has anyone ever told you that you have a movie star name? No, I've always been called I'm Mr. Goody Two Shoes or Mr. Goodbar. Ken, Ken Good just sounds to me like it's like something you'd see on a movie poster for like an action clip or something. Well, and that's why you have the W on it, because when you just say Ken Good, it's a lot like Ken Good. <laughs> <laughs> and then to introduce you uh, to myself as well, my name is Brandon Hill. Uh, I'm a multimedia journalist located up here in Boston. I did my undergrad at the University of Missouri in print digital production. Um, sort of focused on writing about male mental health and stuff like that. Um, I did my master's degree at Emerson College up here in Boston. Um, and with a little bit of relevance to the subject we're going to be talking about today, I wrote about uh, racial and cultural discrimination in the criminal justice system, as well as I did my capstone on the impact of COVID-19 on um, sort of a resurgence in the labor movement in Boston. So uh, some of my questions have regards with like what COVID-19 has done to the impact of, you know, bail reform um, and crime rates as well. But I guess we'll just start real nice and simple. Um, when we say bail reform, what exactly are we talking about? Well, first of all, let me say thank you. Thank you for uh, talking to with you today. I, I yeah, look forward you. to it, and it's nice to meet you. Uh, what do we mean by we talk about bail reform? I think, uh, you know, I kind of talk about it as in the standpoint of good bail reform and bad refor bail reform. I think what the public thinks about bail reform, I would classify as bad bail reform because we're uh, ending accountability and we're tying the hands of judges so they can't address uh, true criminals, uh, either criminals who are committing violent crimes or criminals who are career criminals or gang members or organized crime, and they've figured out a way to take advantage of, of what, um, you know, good intention people are doing to the criminal justice system, and they're making lots of money off of it. So as far as good bail reform and bad bail reform, what would you consider to be, uh, I guess, just the overall objectives of bail reform? What are the things that through bail reform um, are would be like a positive thing that we can see as as a result of actions that we take to reform our current policies. Well, let me address both sides. So bad bail reform, I think it started with the argument that the current bail system was going to be held unconstitutional. And so we needed to come up with something new. And we weren't going off of science. We weren't going off of what we know when we teach criminology in college. We were going off of really advocacy groups uh, and what they were saying we should be doing. And it was based on this theory of everybody wants to come to court. They don't need bail. Everybody wants to resolve their criminal cases. And I think COVID taught us that that's all wrong. We have to have accountability. And so I think from the bad bail reform movement, we've seen a lot of examples of, of what happens when you end accountability and you tie the hands of judges. From the standpoint of good bail reform, when you underscore accountability and you give judges uh, the the tools that they need and you actually tell them that they should hold people accountable even with they if they don't come to court or if they uh, fail to appear or if they continue to commit more and more crime like here's a good example in Texas they require judges to look at criminal history before setting bail before two sessions ago it was the judge had the discretion to but never was required to. The number one indicator of whether you're going to commit crime in the future is whether you've committed crime in the past. And so reviewing your criminal history and setting bail is probably, the I would say, one of the best things that's been done in Texas for be positive bail reform. Mm -hmm. And bail reform largely over the last couple of years, I mean, has kind of been implemented in small and large ways all over the country. Um, the primarily, primary ones we're talking about is, you know, New Jersey was one of the very first to implement bail reform. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then Cook County, California, Harris County um, are a lot of these places where like some of these larger, more sweeping um, bail reforms have come into place. And I, and I think... The, well, then you've got New York, then you've yeah, got the whole state of California, and you've got the whole state of California on misdemeanors does exactly what Harris County does. 
uh, but, but they did it through a court case, and you're getting the same results. If you have an 80% failure to appear rate as a result of these reforms, that's bad. And both California misdemeanor courts, according to the Yolo County DA, has an 80% failure to appear rate. And according to HarrisCountyCourtWatch.com, there's a two years worth of data that averaged on misdemeanor courts using these simple release mechanisms that have over an 80% failure to appear rate. That will cause a collapse of the criminal justice system. Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about that um, COVID-19 impact in that Yolo County study. Um, so I guess, first of all, uh, just, you know, in your thoughts and opinions, you know, what ways has the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I guess we could say sort of sped up uh, bail reform? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what I say is, or uh, what I would uh, identify or point out is during COVID, we saw a lot of these suggested reforms on steroids because we tried them out. We didn't want people in jail. We were scared of, of the pandemic. We didn't know what was going to happen. And so we had a lot of people that were released on simple release mechanisms. And in, you know, California, they call it released on zero bail. New York, they were, they call it released on no bond. And in Texas, we call it released on a personal bond. But they're all simple release where we're releasing you on your own promise. And we had uh, the same results everywhere it was tried. And, you know, California on steroids, we saw people getting arrested over and over again within minutes, sometimes within days, some uh, for similar crimes. And what we were doing is um, charge-based release instead of uh, a, a release mechanism based on your criminal history. So if you're arrested for car theft, well, we're discounting that during COVID, so we're just going to release you. We're tying the hands of judges. You can't be held. So no matter how many times you co commit theft, you're going to be released. And criminals saw that as a green light to commit more crime. And and part of that reasoning, too, is because, you know, due to overcrowding of jails, given the pandemic circumstances, you know, um, there was very real concern from officials that COVID could um, spread, you know, in overcrowded jails as well. So then, you know, we see this, this, uh, I guess we'll call it like emergency bail reform, I believe is the term that they used in California, um, with the Yolo County, uh, survey. And well, this, the Yolo County study is, it's, it's not, it's all it did was kept data during that period. And so it released its data and then it was criticized. And then it went back and compared someone that of similar status who was released on, the zero bail and someone who was released on a surety bond and found devastating results, a 200% greater risk of someone that was just simply released committing a violent offense in the next 18 months over someone released on a, a surety bail. I mean, if, if that's, I mean, that's not been contested, how could you ever release somebody on a simple release if, if that's true? And, and you know what? It is true. I mean, it's not been uh, disputed as, as, um, uh, as good data. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about a lot of the conflicting reports because one of the things I did in preparing for this interview was just read <laughs> tons and tons and tons of studies and stuff. Um, and I've got some of my own personal criticisms that kind of lump into several different areas of the study. But um, that Yolo County study um, was they compared the recidivism, recidivism rates of uh, posted bail and zero bail for the years 2018 and 2019, um, and then compared it to the years 2020 and 2021. Um, so they're comparing this like pre-COVID area to this, um, you know, area era that's during COVID, uh, which obviously during COVID, you obviously have this massive, massive um, increase in crime and nonviolent crime that's happening as, you know, a result of these things that are tangential to the bail releases. Um, so one of the difficulties, you know, that we see when we look at this uh, and these impacts is just how many different factors um, are going into these recidivism rates. So how do we know that we can control specifically for whether or not it is a result of a cash bail or a zero bail policy? Well, that's a very interesting argument because the whole recidivism issue is an issue that's being fought over just statistics. I mean, it's being fought across the country. We're You've mentioned California, the same fight being fought in New York. Um, uh, you know, the same fight's being fought in Harris County. You've got a monitor 
who's filing a report every six months in Harris County, who's defending the settlement or whatever you want to call it, the following of the O'Donnell case, even though it's been reversed and overturned by Fifth, the Fifth Circuit and said it should have never been filed. They're still following it. And we have this fight amongst the uh, people defending uh, the bail reform and the and the law enforcement saying recidivism has just increased dramatically as a result of these changes in Harris County. The fight was between the monitor who's defending, saying, oh, it's 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 fine. It's like it's nothing. And you've got the sitting Democrat D.A. coming in and filing a report saying, no, it's there's substantial uh, recidivism as a result of these reforms. New York, you've got the same thing. The legislators who passed the bail reform defending it, saying recidivism is one percent. And you got a, a ex-D.A. up there d- d- doing the numbers. I think I did a podcast with him talking about how it is that these numbers in California, New York, and in Harris County, there's such a disparity over the arguments of recidivism. And he made a very good point. They're cooking the books. They're taking the people who commit a crime and they're they're using a denominator of all criminals and to make that a very small number and said, that's not the way you calculate recidivism. You calculate recidivism on the small group that are committing multiple crimes, and then you compare that going forward, has that increased or not? And the studies that set, just look at that are finding dramatic increase in, in recidivism. And it just makes common sense. If in New York you release somebody for uh, just common theft or like New York, uh, California, you don't even prosecute the theft under $950 anymore in certain urban areas, why wouldn't that be perceived as a green light? Just common sense says the, you're going to have more crime in those areas because it's a free-for-all. That's why you have stores closing because they can't withstand $25,000 a day in shoplifting. That's why in San Francisco you see commercial property values tanking from you know, selling for 30% of their value just a couple of years ago or 50% of their value. So this, And then you've got the um, NAACP in Oakland demanding from their local Democrat elected officials a state of emergency on crime. You can't say recidivism is not a problem. You can't say crime isn't going up when you look at all of the data. I mean, it's not in dispute, but we're going through a presidential election again. This is the third election where one party is saying crime's not up, crime's down. And, you you know, if the other side's saying it's up, it's just a perception problem. It's not a reality. Well, I, th- I don't think I, that settled think, this time. I think the data shows that since, you know, the 19, what is it, 19? <laughs> don't hit me with data. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, let's see. Both FBI and BJS data mm-hmm. show dramatic declines in U.S. violent and property crime rates since the early 1990s uh, when mm-hmm. crime spiked across much of the nation. Now, using FBI data, which is only covering reported data, right? These are only crimes that are reported. So there's an argument that can be made for um, under-reporting of crimes, right? Um, but the- well, I think I also criticize the FBI data currently because it's become political. And specifically, there's a couple of uh, – if you look at the FBI data, they say they pull data from this county – and you go to that county, and that county is reporting that crime is up, but for some reason the FBI data is reporting it's down for that county. You can't resolve those two uh, issues. I think part of the issue is depending on you know whether we're looking at, at reported numbers or whether we're just talking to people. I, as a member of the media, I have issues with how the media covers crime. Um, you know, if you if you poll people across the country, they they do say that crime is up, um, but they usually tend to say that crime is not up in their area; it's up in I disagree with that. The best statistics on crime, whether crime is going up, is car thefts. And the reason why is because insurance companies will not pay off a claim for a theft without first having a police report. And if you look specifically, just look at our urban areas on car thefts, they're up 25% pretty much every year. I mean, I mean, if it's not 25%, it's a dramatic increase. And And that's not an outlier that is indicative of of what's going on with crime. You can't look in our urban areas and when the NAACP in Oakland is demanding a state of emergency on crime, you can't look at that and say, well, crime's not really up. No, it's up and it's hurting our black and brown communities worse than any other area because those are the ones that get hit first. The So the Pew Research Center is actually reporting that the FBI is saying that motor vehicle theft is down by 53% um, between 1993 and 2022. Well, okay. So let me address that. So 
because you've got urban areas where it's up 25% over years and in, in several years in a row. But let me just say, you know, where we're, where we're cherry picking our data, the vast majority of the United States is still following what we teach in college on criminology. So they're following the tried and true tr- t- methods of, cr- of, of fighting crime. So you could say the vast majority of the country, a large parts of it, that's probably true. But you cannot say that for our urban areas and, and for two reasons. Number one, we're decriminalizing a lot of crime. So every time in California where somebody steals something under $950, that's no longer considered a crime, even though it's having a dramatic impact in California. And so that's cooking the books if you're saying that's not a crime. It's not, it's not harming our public safety. And when you've got the mayor of New York, who is a sitting Democrat, who is fighting the far left of his own party because he's being attacked in New York City. And he's saying, look, if one of the foundations of our society is public safety, and if you can't provide public safety, then you don't have a society. I think he's agreeing. Now, he's going to say he has the safest large city in, in the United States, but that's measuring on a curve right now because I don't think any of our urban areas are safe right now. Yeah, the um, the prosecution of you know misdemeanor burglary under nine hundred fifty dollars isn't isn't it something I definitely wanted to ask you about um, because and I guess this is just my understanding of like legal process as well um, is that it's an active choice by the DA to not prosecute those crimes or who who is sort of the person who right because the the law is set that says okay below this amount of crime is no longer a felony it's now a misdemeanor. No. Yeah. Well, so they had a petition drive, Prop 47 in New York, where they asked the voters to change certain felonies, and that's one of them, to a misdemeanor. And their argument that they made was it will help those people find jobs, and uh, but they'll still have to answer for their crimes. And then once they de- changed it from a felony to a misdemeanor, we had certain uh, DAs in our urban areas said they no longer were going to prosecute it. So they just decided they weren't going to prosecute it, like the one in uh, San Francisco, the one in uh, L.A. and other DAs. And, you know, it was tried in Dallas County, and they only did it for a short period of time because of the bad ramifications from it. And so uh, it was a choice. Now, there is a initiative on the uh, California ballot for November to repeal Prop 47 because of, of the bad results. So the interesting thing is, since the DAs in the urban areas have elected not to prosecute those crimes anymore, even though they're still crimes, but they're not prosecuting them or classifying them as crimes. What are they going to do if that's repealed? Because I expect that the voters are fed up with what's going on and they're going to repeal that. And then what's Gascon going to do? Well, first of all, I think he's going to lose his election in November. But if he doesn't, what's he going to do? He's not going to start prosecuting those crimes because the people who supported him for election, that was one of the things he ha- agreed to do. He, I mean, there's a whole long story there that we could talk about, but that's what they expect of him. And so it would be hard for him to go back. But that's one of the reasons why I do not think he'll be reelected. Yeah. The, and the reelection is a good point, because I think that there's a difference between the voters saying, OK, we don't think that this should be a felony and shouldn't impact people's job chances. And the voters saying, like, no, we don't want that to be prosecuted at all. Um, so well, if you'd asked the voters when they had that, you know, Prop 47, if you'd asked them, hey, we're going to decriminalize this, they would have voted no. They would have voted no in a huge number. But that's not what they were asked. Right. And so, that's part of my criticism of the right wing, you know, the, the conservative think tanks, because they all got in line and joined that. They supported Prop 47. But it was clearly I mean, if you look at that now, it was clear that they were, you know, going to no longer prosecute that in our urban areas. And so for the for the conservative think tanks not to think think ahead and point that out, I'm critical of them as well. Right. But doesn't that point out more of a systemic failure than it does like a conceptual failure? Right. The, no. the idea that like minor crimes shouldn't result in, um, you know, felony indictments that prohibit large swaths of people from employment and, and you know, equal opportunity and stuff like this. This is the best example I can give you. So, okay, so the best indication of whether you're going to be successful in school is whether the dropout rate. And so so your school decides to address the dropout rate to to make it lo- uh, go lower is to force teachers to pass you whether you deserve it or not. Now, 
you could make an argument that that's very similar to what they're doing on Prop 47 and their decision not to prosecute crime. They're, they're, they're trying to lift up people who are failing in society by looking the other way. The problem is that doesn't work. I mean, what's going on in California is is its own problem because they have a problem with they don't have enough capacity in their prison system. It's been capped. And so everything they've been doing, Prop 47 included, has been done just to decrease their prison population. Until they build additional capacity, we're, they're going to continue to have problems in California because they can't hold anybody accountable for not doing what they're supposed to be doing because they don't have the space. Yeah, that's kind of a good opportunity to jump back on cash bail reform since we did get off, off topic a little bit there. But I think you know one of the goals of cash bail reform um, is to reduce the number who are, of people who are being held in jail purely because they can't financially pay, right? On any given day, um, there's between 400 and 500,000 people who are held in jails for the U.S. purely because they're not able to afford a cash bond. Um, well, okay. I think that that is a talking point of one side of the discussion. It's not one that I agree with because, you know, the bail system has been criticized. The private bail industry has been in- criticized for not working with people. Currently in Harris County, they're being criticized for working too much with people. So, you know, if if you can do a a five thousand dollar bond, which would be five hundred dollars, and you can do that on a payment plan. Then I don't agree that you're going to be held in jail. And also, if you are in jail and you have a criminal history, you're not being in, held in jail because you can't afford to pay bail. You're being held in jail because you have a criminal history, and they're not going to lower your bond. And so I don't agree that right, at any given point still a- we have people being held in jail because you know the whole point is the argument is well you courts can't hold you. They have to release you on what you can afford to pay. And the courts have addressed that and rejected that argument. Yeah, there was in the 80s and the 90s, they allowed you to apply like a public safety program to uh, the employer. Currently, the 11th Circuit and the 5th Circuit, the 5th Circuit in the Dave's case, Dave's versus Dallas County, which was after O'Donnell, and the 11th Circuit in uh, a Calhoun versus Georgia, but both held bail as constitutional and you don't have a right to release. All you have is a right to a hearing asking the court to hey, I can't afford the bail you set. Please consider these cons- these uh, reasons why I would like for it to reduce. And if you have a criminal history and the court says, no, I'm not reducing it, then you're not in jail because you can't afford to pay. You're in jail because you have a criminal history and you're a public safety risk. Right, but someone with that more financial means would be able to afford that. So there is a disparity between whether or not, you know, that person's financial status is a determining factor in whether or not they're held. And also, you know, but, but that's only about. one factor. That's only one factor. It's not right. the determining factor. And that's the problem with the the other side. They want it to be the only factor considered. I mean, just like this whole argument that we have racial uh, systemic racism and racial disparity in the jail. I, I mean, you know, I know you you feel like you, you you're well equipped on that. But there's a lot of studies out recently that are talking about. The reason why we have a disparity of people in jail is because we have a disproportionate amount of crime being committed on black and brown people. And by and large, they're being committed by the same racial group. So we have a disproportionate amount of crime being committed by them. And if you don't agree with that and you're wrong, then the very groups that are being hurt the most by these proposed reforms is the groups they're seeking to help. Those crimes are not necessarily committed by racial disparities as much as they are committed by racial disparities, poverty and income. Right. Like when we're talking about. Well, but, but it's the same community. We generations and generations. Oh. But by and large, race is committed by the same racial group that it's that is that the that the group that it's committed on. I mean, look at a murder rates. Fifty percent of all murders in the United States are young black males. By and large, the people that commit that murder are young black males. Somehow in this whole debate, we have decided to favor the young black male murderer over the young black male victim. I mean, that's a first in in the history of our country, I think. Yes, and these communities that you're talking about, you know, when we talk about the 700% increase in crime that's taken place since the 1970s, um, or sorry, not the 700%, the 700% increase in incarceration um, that has taken place since the 1970s, um, an extremely disproportionate amount of that has been done in these inner city uh, minority black and brown communities. And, you know, there's a wealth of data that shows that, you know, repeated incarceration um, increases recidivism. When we even look at, you know, weighing cash bail against uh, 
release on recognizance. You know, there's data that shows that anyone who stays in jail for longer than three days uh, has a 34% chance of, of recidivizing. So that's not that's not data. That's common sense. I mean, that's one uh, left wing think think tank issuing a paper that's being cited by another left wing think tank. I mean, it's it's not a study saying that. I mean, it's get it's cited as oh, this is this is a study. There's a study that says that it's common sense. The longer you're in jail, the more it's going to hurt you. But that's true for criminals. I mean, if that's not a reason to release criminals, it's not a release. It's not a reason to release somebody accused of murder. I mean, you're not in jail. I mean, the reason why you're in jail is to give assurance that you're going to return to answer the criminal charges. If you can't give the court a reasonable assurance because of your criminal history or because of the your public safety risk that you won't return and that you won't commit another crime, the court has the right to hold you. Uh, or set your bail at a point that you will, in effect, be held. The courts have held that that's constitutional. Now, the whole point about, you know, black and brown inner cities, look, Minnesota or, yeah, Minnesota did a study just recently where, I mean, it's not a study. They tracked all the people who were arrested and they went back all the way down to who was calling in those crimes. And while there, there was a disproportionate number of black and brown people who were arrested, but they were treated better than other racial groups once they got into the criminal justice system. But the number of arrests and the, the victims, it was 10 to 1 that we have a disproportionate amount of crime being committed on uh, black and brown communities. And if you take a step back about the victims, I mean, you know, the perpetrators, we would agree that our minority communities have a disproportionate amount of crime being committed against them. Where we get into this disagreement is, well, we have a disproportionate amount of black and brown communities in jail. No, if one is true, then the other will be true because by and large, we commit crime on our same racial groups. I mean, there's also a disparity in literally just like concentration of policing, right? You're going to have more arrests and more crimes in areas where there are more. more. Wait, would you repeat Would you repeat that? I had a call coming in blocking yeah, what I could hear. Uh, yeah, um, I was talking about the, you know, disparities in policing that began as far back as the 1970s. You know, um, a higher concentration of police in an area is going to result in more arrests. Um, you know, police specifically looking for black and brown perpetrators, stop and frisk, you know. Um, stop and frisk is not does not take advantage of any race. And stop and frisk is a a principle of criminology that is taught to this day as a proven method for reducing crime, just like the broken windows theory. The problem is we have one side of our electorate or one side of our political parties who have decided to attack it as a, race, as a racial thing. And, you know, the, cults, the courts ultimately held it constitutional, even though they no longer do it in New York. But the courts held it as constitutional, not racist, not violating racial pr problems. And you see that where anything that works gets, you know, in criminal justice gets attacked as racist. I mean, the courts also determined in 1984, so I'm trying to look up this specific case, 1987, um, McCleskey v. Kemp, that any racial bias, bias in sentencing, uh, whether or not shown through statistical credible evidence, could not be challenged under the 14th Amendment. So I think that there, you know, there is a legal precedence to remove uh, overwhelming data showing racial um, biasness in the criminal justice system. You know, there's a legal press. I don't. I don't agree with that. I don't agree that we have racial bias. I mean, look, I'm a product. I mean, I, I'm an attorney. I, I don't do criminal law, but I mean, I believe very strongly in the criminal justice system. I think it is a false talking point to say we have a uh, systemic racism in the criminal justice system. in our urban areas, when the prosecuting attorney is black, when the defense attorney is black, the defendant's black, the judge is black, the bailiff is black. How can you argue that that person is suffering from systemic racism? Because despite being 13 percent of the population, uh, black people comprise 62 percent of incarcerated drug offenders, um, regardless of the fact that black and white people consume drugs at a similar or statistically eventual Ripped. Like, I, I think, you know, there's... I've already pointed out the data doesn't support that. The, the data, data supports we have a disproportionate amount of crime being committed by our black and brown communities, which explains why we have a disproportionate amount of black and brown communities in our jails. And if you're incorrect on your argument, 
the harm that's being done by these policies that you're setting up is hurting the black and brown communities the most. I mean, I'm talking specifically about the very observable difference in a drug offense incarceration, which I think some work has been done, you know, to repair that. Um, there's a massive demonstrable disparity there. You know, we can talk about, you know, rates of other crime and where they're committed and, and where the arrests are being made for that. But I, I think that the, the evidence of drug offense disparity is a clear example of disparity in the criminal justice system, especially when, you know, something like 75% of the 500,000 people being held um, on bail are in there for drug or property crimes. Okay. First of all, I'm talking about pre-incarceration. So I'm talking about, I'm not talking about post-incarceration. So we're talking about pretrial release. So we're getting somebody back to court to answer their charges. So, I mean, th we're talking about a very different situation when it's post-conviction and they're going to the big house, they're going to the, uh, the, the state jail system. That's after everything that we're here to talk about. And so, I mean, that really doesn't have anything to do with the private bail system uh, for post-conviction. But I will say that I know, you, I know that you are you've someone who studied this issue and you I mean, I'm going to just say I think you drunk the Kool-Aid because I, I don't I've studied this issue. I've issue as well. I've written a lot of articles. I went and looked at same studies as well. When when Minnesota does this releases their data because they started collecting everything down to who's reporting the crime and they're reporting 10 to 1 that on the reports of crime are disproportionate into our black and brown communities. Well, that explains why we have a disparity in that state on the people who are going to jail. I mean, it's all the way down to the reporting of crime, and it's being reported by the very uh, racial groups that we're saying we have a disproportionate number in in the jail. I, I, I just there's I mean, that's not the only study. There's lots of other studies that have been reported to Congress saying we don't have a dis a systemic racist system. And there's reasons why we have a disproportionate number of minorities in our prison system. And you can even look at our history and you can explain uh, through history why we have a disproportionate amount of, of certain minorities in our prison system. We used to discount crime. You know, uh, we used to say if if you were, um, you know, black on black crime would be something you would hear in East Texas 20 years ago. We would not prosecute that as much because we devalued them as citizens. And so as a result, you would see people handling issues amongst themselves. And when society said, no, we're going to start addressing those types of crimes equally like anything else, well, they were addressing their things with vigilante justice disproportionate to the rest of society. And I do think that that explains some of the history as to why we have a disproportionate amount of crime, because they were taught for a long time, as long as you were taking advantage of your own racial group, then society would care less. We care now because we're all equal. We're equal before God and we're equal in before society. And so we're still fighting that history uh, because they've been, you know, certain groups have been taught that it's okay as long as it's just you stay within your racial group. I mean, I think and I, I want to, I've got some other stuff I want to talk about, so I want to kind of get off this topic. But, um, you know, I, I think generally that people tend to commit crime against whoever's around them um, for the most and part. Unless it's we stick crime with our same racial group. Violent crime, domestic crime, burglaries are a little bit different, crimes of opportunity are a little bit different. Um, but yeah, by and large, you're committing crime on whoever your community is, whoever is. Um, but returning sort of to, you know, the Cashville concept when it comes to this. Sure. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to that, you know, that 500,000 people uh, that we're talking about that are being held uh, due to a financial inability to pay or post, right? Um, and you're saying that it's not a financial ability. Um, it's because they are a repeat criminal um, and a judge has observed their repeat record and determined that because of their record, they are a higher flight risk. And so we're going to give them a higher bond, right? Well, I would, I would say it that way. I would agree with that, but I would say it in a different way. I would say if you're a first-time offender, we lean more on your ability to pay because you don't show any risk to public safety. You don't show any criminal history. And as that changes, then you, the judge's willingness to lower it is going to be less and less. Unless, like under b bad bail reform, we tie the hands of judges so we order them to release them. Like 
you know, a charge-based system, like in California or New York, if you're charged with just car theft. Well, that's not a violent offense, so we're just going to release you every time you do it. Still a Cadillac converter. A lot of places, are not even, they're not even prosecuting that anymore. But if you get arrested, you're just going to be released. I mean, there's a situation in Harris County recently where someone didn't realize they kind of slipped over into the neighboring county of Montgomery County, just did a, a Cadillac converter. And when he was arrested, they were taking him to the jail. And he's like, well, this isn't the way to the Harris County jail. And they're like, no, it's not. You came into Montgomery County and we prosecute criminals here in Montgomery County. And they were very upset. And so I just think this concept of knowing where you are and if you quit prosecuting things or you stop uh, holding people accountable, they realize it. And they realize those two people realized it very quickly in Montgomery County. Yeah. So, but I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about like there is the option of not allowing bail, right? There is a judge can say this person is too much of a risk, uh, whether that's a flight risk or a risk to the community. We're not going to allow them to post bail. And we're about depends to on the situation. Like in Texas, we have a constitution that says everyone has a right to bail unless, you know, you're our specific offense listed in the uh, constitution, like capital murder. And like if you are arrested and you have two previous felony convictions, they can deny you bail. But that's still it's just a denial. But I would say. Initially, when you're arrested, the only option is to set bail higher. They don't have an option to deny. But if you have a failure to appear or um, if you do something in your case to show that you're not going to comply, you breach or breach a uh, condition of your bond, like you don't you you break your GPS or you don't go to drug testing or fellow drug test. Once you do something like that, I think then the court has the ability to deny you bail. Right. So but if a judge is setting a bail higher and higher and higher in order to try to keep you there. They're still using your financial capability to hold you in jail. And I think that's what people have the problem with. Like, I agree. And like you said yourself, it's it's constitutional based on public safety um, to hold someone in jail until their trial. And so I guess I just, my question is, you know, but why? The argument you were making, but the argument you're making was made in the O'Donnell versus Harris County case. That that's a de facto uh, preventative detention when you're setting a bail in an amount they cannot afford. The Fifth Circuit rejected that argument. And so, you know, that's where this whole concept comes. Well, you can't set bail an amount higher than they can afford. I agree with that as a first time offender. But if you have a criminal history, that's not I don't agree with it. And that's what the courts have held. So the argument you're making has been rejected by the courts and it went up to the Supreme Court and they refused to hear the case. So, I mean, that argument is an argument that we still hear and we still hear it from the attorneys that argued all these cases that went up on appeal. They don't even point out that their arguments have been rejected by the courts. They just continue to throw out the same argument. Right. So I'm saying, like, why are why be in favor of a cash bail system um, over a better, you know, uh, public safety analysis system? And I know um, you yourself recommend what is it called? Individual magistration um, as part uh, of one of the things. That's one of the. And, well, that's so one of the part of this question is, too. Is, that it satisfies the requirements of the Constitution. So, you know, we, we're looking at how do we get people through the jail effectively and quickly, you know, when they're arresting on average 5,000 people a week. I mean, how do you process that many people? And, you know, the number one way is you have a bail schedule. Anybody that can afford to have set to post bail according to the schedule, that's very quick. But, you know, in Harris County, that was under attack. And so they won't do that anymore. And so they've come up with this simple release, which is, again, just releasing people without looking at them, not looking to see if they have a criminal history. It's the same thing as a bail schedule, but this bail amount is zero or free. It's a $100 personal bond. That's not working either. And it's not in compliance with Texas law currently because the legislature enacted SB6. So the two ways that Harris County has posted or set bail and misdemeanors for the last 15 years Neither one of them comply with current law, and they're still doing it. So if and I think the article that you're pointing at is uh, pointing to is I was proposing how do we how do we get Harris County in compliance with Texas law? And the the one way we do it is individual magistration. It's very expensive, uh, but that complies with Texas law because Texas law requires the magistrate to review their criminal history before setting bail. 
Another way they could do it is have a bail schedule based on whether you have a criminal history or not. If you Here's the charge. If you have a criminal history, it's this amount. If you don't, it's this amount. And then, uh, and then allow them to have a hearing if they say ca- they can't afford that and ha- have a hearing within 48 hours. But you know, here's the problem with and your um, argument, well, why would it be better to have the private system versus just a simple release mechanism system? It's well, not even, I'll hold you there, not even necessarily a simple release system. Like, I like what you say about individual magistration. I do believe that there should be someone evaluating individual cases, um, considering things like criminal history, uh, previous failure to appear, like all this kind of stuff is, I think, common sense to consider. Uh, whether or not a person is a flight risk or a public safety risk on release. Uh, so I don't, well, I don't like the word public safety risk and public safety. You know, the public safety release. Well, the public safety. No, uh, there's a there's a there's a uh, tool that is determining the risk. The that's been uh, set up by the uh, by a foundation in in Florida. Arnold and uh, yeah, the Arnold Foundation, and it's and it's um and it's been kind of debunked. I mean, it's uh, not proposed to be used, so I don't like to talk about any type of risk system. But I think judges and bondsmen do that every day. They assess a risk. What is the risk if we bond this defendant out? And the judge is setting a risk when they do an individual review of the bond of the defendant to determine whether he should have bail set at an amount where he could get out or whether he should have bail set at a larger amount so that his likelihood of getting out is low. I mean... See, I guess that's just where I get stuck is whenever that like financial capability is determined in that likely and whether or not that they're likely to be released or not. Because then I just see, you know, a a danger... Okay, but you're not going to have a problem with this. Let's put it in a real world application. Someone's charged with murder and we're going to start our bond at a million dollars. And then we're going to look at it. Okay, it's, he's never been accused with anything else, so we're going to lower it. But if he's not, if he has a substantial criminal history, like, you know, there's a lady that was uh, killed as she was leaving Walgreens in the parking lot, someone who was out on a simple release with two felony bonds and had, he was probably had been arrested over 35 times. And you're not going to have any problem with that million dollar bond on him being not lowered because of his criminal history. We're, the problem is you're looking at this in the abstract and the people who are not having their bond released, it's because of their criminal history or other reasons, not because of this, their ability to pay. Well, I mean, but by that same argument, if that guy is able to, you know, I, I don't like individual sensationalized incidents too much, but I'll, I'll, I'll go with this. If that same guy is able to lead you know, some kind of public campaign to raise that million dollars, he's out, right? You know, he say he's got a uncle's cousin somewhere, you know, was... Or a public or, or a, a charitable bail fund that wants to post it for him. I mean, you know, we had all this money raised for charitable bail funds during uh, the George uh, uh, George uh, uh, protests, riots, whatever you want to call it. I mean, millions and millions of dollars, it's been used to post uh, free bail for people. I mean, that's under the current system. So I, mean, I don't... I mean, look, if they set your bell, you can't afford it, and someone wants to come and post it for you, great. But if no one does, I mean, our Constitution and the courts say that's the current system. We can't destroy the current system because we want to be fair to everybody. We have the fairest criminal justice system in the world, but, you know, it's not treat everybody the same. That's not the cornerstone of our criminal justice system. Our corner, The corner of it is if you're arrested and it's your first time, we want to give you the least amount of pressure that we can give you to get you to reform and become a, a, a good citizen. If it doesn't work and you get arrested again, well, we're not going to give you the same treatment. We're going to give you a bit more pressure. The problem is the push that we're having from the left and the far left is we want to treat everybody the same. Period. No matter how many times they've been arrested. And that's where it's failing because they're seeing that as a green light. I I don't know if that's necessarily sure. There may be some people that are pushing for that. I don't know if that's necessarily how I would describe bail reform. I can give you a great example. One of the requirements, if you're you're supported by Soros and you're elected DA, is you will no longer file enhancements. And where it's killing us right now is on drug crime. So if you arrest a drug dealer who has 40 pounds of fentanyl, you're going to charge him with possession of drugs. You're not going to do the enhancement because that's part of the quid pro quo. 
And so as a result, he gets two weeks instead of 20 years. Two weeks is a cost of doing business to him instead of 20 years when the problem is solved. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess I'm returning to like the individual magistration thing. Um, cause I think that that is kind of where I, you know, follow along with you and, and as we're sort of winding down the interview here, I want to talk about your suggestions for bail reform, um, based on the article, uh, good bail reform, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what successful criminal justice reform looks like. Um, sure. and uh, a lot of this looks, I mean, very good to me. A lot of the stuff you're saying, individual magistration, uh, I think makes a lot of sense. I think separate from, um, the public safety assessment algorithms. Um, you know, I prefer an individual person using information that they attain through an algorithm uh, rather than, you know, algorithms are just a substitution for bail schedules. In a similar way, it's plugging the values. Well, me. but, okay, I'm going to tell you something. That's very expensive for our urban areas. And so if you wanted to do the equivalent of that a lot cheaper, you just have a bail schedule overlaid on top of it. And then for the people who can't afford the bail schedule, they come before the court, they do an individual assessment, and they set their bail either in um, – affirm the bail schedule amount, or they reduce it. That would be so much cheaper for our counties and would not cost a dime uh, to the criminal justice system. But the problem is, is the uh, bail schedule is so out of disfavor, we're pushing this, you know, it's not pushing it, but the only way you could comply with the court's rulings is individual magistration. And that's just costing a phenomenal amount of money in our urban areas. And I think for no reason. Uh, because you can get to the same result because one of the other um, uh, things that I argue strongly for is a, a layer of accountability. So whether they get out on a bail schedule or they get an individual determination of what their bail amount, their actions after they get admitted to bail, they're going to be held accountable for. That's what's missing right now. And the reason why it's missing is because we're setting up a system where we're dismissing so many cases. We just have so much chaos that you can't hold anybody accountable. Look at Harris County right now. Their jails are full. Uh, they're full of very dangerous people. So you don't have room. So this little misdemeanor guy has fooling around with the court and doesn't ever come. He's missed 17 times, which we had that. And the courts can't do anything with them because they don't have the space and they're trying to work with the system. So you have to build something where the system has the ability to function, and it has capacity to hold people accountable when they screw up. That's what we're missing because of the of the arguments and the policies that are being put in place by the far left, in my opinion. Yeah, and when we're talking about cost of action, is another example I'm glad you're learning to bring up. We're talking about cost efficiency and accountability, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in order to jail these 500,000 people, you know, we're spending $13.6 Let me double check my Spending $13.6 billion a year on pretrial incarcerations. Um, one system in Washington, D.C., um, which favors a uh, supervised release, um, mm -hmm. is a very, very expensive system, right? Very expensive. But in fact, the guy— compare the cost to how much the pretrial incarcerations are costing. They're saving a million dollars a year. No, no, they're not, because you have to overlay onto it the cost of, of the lack of public safety or decreased public safety. I mean, look at the cost in California alone. Just look at San Francisco and in Los, a in Los Angeles. The cost of so to society of stores closing because they can't withstand 70, uh, $25 a day in uh, shoplifting. You've got businesses, commercial properties that are selling for 25, 30% of their value over two or three years ago, 50% of their value from three years ago. You've got the Nancy Pelosi federal building where they're telling if federal employees don't come to work because it's not safe for you to even walk for, park your car, walk into the building. The cost, what, what you're not taking into consideration is the great cost for a failure to provide public safety and what that's doing to our, our communities and our society. The cost of that is, you know, it's doing so much damage. Look at the flight from California. I mean, it will take a generation to repair that. But first we have to get society. I mean, I think prop repealing Prop 47 is the first step. But we still have a lot of, of elected officials that are going to have to be replaced to change that mentality. You can see it working because the governor of California just announced that uh, communities should start uh, removing um, um, 
you know, the uh, people that are just uh, living on the streets. Uh, and that's a result of the Supreme Court ruling. But I think it's also a result we have an election in four months. Yeah. It, when you're talking about those, you know, the crimes that you're talking about being committed here, are those crimes being committed by pretrial defendants under supervision? Well, that's the whole point of recidivism. And that's the whole argument. You've got um, you've got groups that are saying that the recidivism rates are going through the roof. So that means people who are on pretrial release. The the Yolo County studies made the point that recidivism was increasing greatly. The point in New York was the that recidivism is is uh, in, uh, increasing greatly. And the in the DA in Harris County said recidivism is in, uh, is in, uh, increasing greatly. But you've got the defenders of the potential of the change saying, no, it's not. And so we have this whole argument about, well, what is it or is it not? And you've got to argue that Democrat elected officials are cooking the books to say recidivism is increasing to, for that argument. I mean, I, I've got another study here that says that Harris County judges that are against bail reform are cooking the books as well. So I, I think one of the, the most- <laughs> Well, that's one of the problems is- this Is purely is how politics. much the, the, the data is not well, no, it's how politics has gotten into criminal justice reform. Well, I think politics is inherent to criminal justice reform. Some, well, it is now. I don't think it has been. Somebody has to decide not just what is illegal, but what is the severity of a crime and what level of punishment does it deserve. That inherently is political. If it's not political, then it's not democratic. And then who's making those decisions, right? There's no well, strict. Well, we've drawn the line right now where we're not going to no longer going to prosecute crime under theft under $950 is clearly not the right spot. And I think it's going to impact elections in California. And I think proposition may very well be reformed. And there's going to be a ton of money spent on the politics to try to keep that from happening. But I, I do believe, I agree with you to a certain extent, politics is, a, is always a part of criminal justice, but it is a part the level of, of politics right now in criminal justice is a level that I've not seen before, and I've been practicing law for over 30 years. I mean, when you've got judges who are opposing the O'Donnell suit in Harris County and they're winning, they went one every time they were appealed, and you've got uh, left-wing elected officials and the newspaper criticizing them because they spent $8 million dollars to defend that lawsuit, even though they won every time. And then, so they get a whole new slate of judges to run against them on the promise that they would settle and give the plaintiffs everything they wanted. And they won. But now they've spent over $100 million to implement a settlement that the Fifth Circuit said on Bonk should have never been entered into. The case was reversed. And Could you elaborate the case on never been filed. Case a little bit. I'm actually not familiar with that. Okay, so in O'Donnell, they were attacking the misdemeanor bonds and and the bail schedule that was in use at the time, and the the criticism was there wasn't an opportunity for the defendants to ask for a uh, for the bond amount to be changed, which has to be when they within seventy two. Well, hours. when they went to their first initial appearance, they were told, "Don't talk. If you talk, anything you use, you say, can be used against you." So they never had an opportunity. So they filed suit on procedural due process, saying, "Hey, we don't we don't have an opportunity for our defendants to ask for a deviation from the bail scheduled amount." The judges would have agreed to that at any time, but the plaintiffs were using that to say, "We want to throw out." the way you're doing bail and change to a simple release system. And the county was willing to agree to it. The judges would not. And so after, even though it was probably one of the very first cases and it went up and the judges kept winning every time they went up on a pre uh, preliminary injunction, it was set by the court. It went up on appeal. It would be reversed. The second time she did it even worse. And so they appealed it again. That time, the Fifth Circuit went even further and issued a stay of what the trial court did, saying that the judges had a high likelihood of, of success. And then we had an election, and then the new judges came in. They actually promised to settle. They agreed to a settlement, which was to give the plaintiffs everything they wanted, even contrary to the previous rulings by the Fifth Circuit. Then we moved to the Dave's case in Dallas County, where they were trying to— um, take the misdemeanor ruling and apply it to federal uh, to the felonies as well. The, and the trial court did. He agreed. We're, I'm, I don't see any difference. And so they went to the Fifth Circuit. The panel said, we're not going to extend it to felonies. And if we were on the original panel, we would have probably not agreed on the misdemeanors. So that was a signal to file an en banc 
rehearing, which is mean that the entire Fifth Circuit, all 16 judges, they granted the unback review, and then they said, we're not even, we won't agree, we're reversing O'Donnell on the um, misdemeanor judges, and then they remanded it back to the trial court on two issues, abstention and uh, mootness because of the change of the law in SB6. The trial court said the trial that the federal court should not abstain in this issue, but that the case was now moot. It went back to the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit overturned the trial court and said the, the federal court should have abstained from considering this either this case or O'Donnell because there was an opportunity for the, the plaintiffs to raise the issue in state court proceedings and said both Davis and O'Donnell should have never been um, filed in federal court, reversed O'Donnell on the misdemeanor judge, reversed it on abstention and um, several other issues, and uh, they're still following the settlement in Harris County today. Yeah, and I think with, when it comes to the judges, like that's a good indication, I think, of why the data on this issue is so important. A judge is not going to change uh, what they know works unless they have substantial data telling them otherwise, right? No, I don't agree with that. There's a uh, there's a police officer, and he was uh, Chief Bruger from Pasadena, Texas, which is right outside of Houston. And he had somebody that commit, uh, p- committed a heinous crime while he was on a personal bond. So he went to the court, and he was there complaining, why did you give this guy a personal bond? And this is what the judge told him. On the record, my party wants me to release people on, more on personal bonds. That's the reason why I did it. So... I don't agree it's that. I think politics has poisoned our criminal justice system currently in Harris County, and we've got to get politics out of it. All right. Well, uh, thank you for your time talking to me. Do you have any other wrap-up points you want to discuss or or go back and emphasize? There's a few things I I didn't get to, but— Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I'd say thank you. Thank you. know. It's always fun to talk to somebody who's really intelligent and knows what they're talking Thank about. You, yeah, I agree. And this but is something I really think I've benefited from doing the amount of research that I, that I did on this. True. I really enjoyed doing that for the podcast. But I would say if people want to know more information about my organization or our organization, they could go to pbtx.com, which is the professional bondsman of Texas. And we have a blog where we highlight criminal justice stories. And then we have our own podcast, which is called The Bell Post. You can go either to our website and see it on the menu, or you can just go to thebellpost.com. We we highlight criminal justice issues. Like you, you mentioned the New Jersey plan. You want to know how it works and why it is what it is. We have an episode on what's the New Jersey plan. We're, we're hoping to educate legislators and the public. And uh, we that's how I became knowledgeable on these issues and having and have I've written numerous articles on these legal issues that we've talked about. And so you can see you bring up something and I'm more than happy to talk about it in, in detail because it's something I've written a lot of articles about. Yeah. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest Thank of your you. day, too. You too, sir.